Welcome to Cover to Cover Book Beat. I'm your host, Roger Nichols. Our guest today, somebody very special. Richard Gid Powers is a professor of history at City University of New York College of Staten Island, professor of American Studies, director of core programs, former president of American Historians of Communism. Now, that'd be cool enough for most people, but he is also a widely published award-winning author who has been writing about the FBI for nearly half a century. He was the principal consultant for a History Channel four-part documentary about the FBI, as well as the PBS documentary, GMIT. He's also edited six volumes of the Greg Press series of science fiction and is editor of Popular Culture International. But the reason we're here today is to talk about his latest book, Secret Agent Gals. It tells the tale of two very real people, Peggy Guggenheim and the Baroness Agent. Well, I'm not sure how to how to pronounce her last name, but we'll let, let him do that. Uh, it, and they were the founders of the Guggenheim Museum. But this tale is set in an alternate universe in which... The two are recruited by a rather dim-ridded version of J. Edgar Hoover to investigate artists they've been rescuing from Germany to ensure no Nazi spies slip through. And as they say, hilarity ensues. We're very pleased to welcome Richard Gid Powers. Hey, God, for having me, and thanks for reading the book. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I have a small diversion before we start talking about the book. Your middle name, Gid, was unfamiliar to me, and I, I looked it up and understood it's short for Gideon, which means great destroyer. Is this a family name or were your parents trying to warn us from the start? Well, you're the first person I think that's made me put it together with the novel because my uncle Gideon, known as Gid, was a farm boy from uh, Elburn, Illinois. And just before I was born, he got shot down and killed over Bremen, Germany. Ooh. And so in the enthusiasm, or I guess you'd say the despair over the death, I was named Gid. And my dad who was quite, quite a joker, took me to the cemetery where his headstone, so to speak, was. And there was a little screw top thing right next to the headstone. And uh, my father told me that if I got down on my knees and look, I was about three years old and, and looked down through it, I'd be able to see my uncle Gid. And so I did. And uh, it was kind of puzzled. He said, well, it's kind of dark down there. It turns out that that's the thing you can put flowers in. Uh, <laughs> the Veterans Administration puts one of those next to every veterans. Uh, <laughs> Gosh. So your father sounds like, no, he was, by the way, a famous science fiction illustrator. Uh, I have many, I've just looked up, I had many books of his uh, covers, mostly paperbacks from the 60s and 70s. So uh, you come from a storied family. Yeah, and actually, uh, if you want, we can just forget about my, about my book and we we'll talk about my dad because he really was a hell, of, a hell of a guy who pretty much invented, or I should say, did invent the surrealistic, mm -hmm. non-realistic uh, science fiction cover that particularly was an emblem of Valentine books, but right. uh, it, it was a number of other uh, pu publishers as well. And uh, at his peak, he was doing about three of these a week, and uh, he, he did about 1,300 all told. Right. What's interesting about them from a reader's perspective is across the store, you can see in the revolving paperback book rack, you can tell from the distance, that's a science fiction book. I want it. So, yeah. 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 Excellent. Well, uh, back to you and and uh, Secret Agent Gals. Um Let's see. Uh, it's been described as how these two plucky gals out with bumbling Nazi assassins, boneheaded communist spies, slick Irish manure cart bombers, it gets crazier, and have to rescue dim-witted FBI directors, fellow secret agents, crazy presidents and first ladies from the dumb messes they get themselves into, which I thought was an excellent description that I, that I found of that. But that just hints at the off-the-chart crazy humor this book has. You know, when I first started reading it, I thought, well, it's okay. It's going to be like an Elmore Leonard or a Carl Hyacin book. But the farther I got, the more I saw it escalate through Fish Call Wanda level all the way up to a mad, 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 mad world and Blazing Saddles level of madcap humor. Was that your goal? And don't forget uh, Austin Powers. Oh, yes, of course. Austin Powers as well. There's probably a little mash in there, too. So, yeah. My, my intent definitely was to write a funny book. And... The, um, I had an editor that looked at the first uh, scene or so 
And it was his uh, conviction that I was trying to write a serious thriller and was failing miserably. And oh, so geez. he began going through it and straightening everything out. Well, of course, I fired him pretty, pretty, pretty quickly. And that's why I have Jagger over taking, I think it's seven, but it might be 11 Pratt Falls uh, in the first two or three pages. I wanted to make sure that people knew that this was slapstick, that they were not going to get any deep pondering on the meaning of the Holocaust or the evils of communism, or for that matter, uh, how wonderful Indians were, because uh, as a kid, uh, I always tended to uh, get painted up to be one of the Indians when we had our Cowboys and Indians fights. But mm -hmm. uh, I wanted people to know it was funny right from the beginning, and I hope I succeeded. Oh, I, yeah. as soon as I cottoned onto that, it was about the third uh uh, slip on a banana peel, which was his burglar defense. I love that. Uh, 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 that I said, okay, I know where we're going here. But one of the other things that was interesting. I mean, there's so many. There's so much in this. It's it's just packed full. It's also 400 pages long, and yet you keep turning and turning and turning. There are anachronisms like crazy. This is an alternate universe because a number of the things you introduce in that time period did not exist in our version of the universe until. Later, things like Play-Doh came out in 58 or or Frankie Lane song Mule Train yeah. was from 1949. Super Soaker is 1989. The Ford F-150, 1975. You sent me to look all these up, which I thought was fabulous. I love people that send me to go explore more. Well, uh, there's another one that I love loved also. In the first couple chapter, well, the first chapter, uh Jagger Hoover Clyde Tolson Hilla. Rebe, is how you say it. Thank you. And Peggy Guggenheim are smoking pot. And <laughs> Hilary Rebe says, you know, I feel like uh, chewing some gummy bears. And <laughs> that's and I right. think listening to Cream, is he out yet? You know, that's, but uh, yes, anachronisms are funny. And I think that uh, having uh, a world war going on and you have these two basically nonviolent people living in a nonviolent universe, but a very funny universe is in itself kind of funny. It is indeed, which reminds me, I think we need to give people a little taste of what this is like. You've uh, agreed to, that you would be comfortable in setting up and reading a section? Yeah. Um, at a certain point, Hillary Bay and Peggy Guggenheim come up with the idea of stealing Hitler's mojo. And they feel that this is something that they can accomplish in the following way. They say, what is his mojo? His mojo is that screwy little mustache and that, that pathetic comb over that he has. And so what they do is they have the Indians around Los Alamos hunt down a snake oil. And this snake oil is the greatest hair remover there's ever been. So first of all, they have to get it to Berlin and get it onto Hitler's mustache and his and his uh, hair uh, comb over. The other thing that's going on here is that Ike has gone on strike and he's not going to invade Europe until someone brings back his girlfriend, Jeep driver, uh, Kate Summersby, another uh, historical character. Yeah. And uh, you can bleep this out if you want, but I don't think you'll want to. He has a case of blue balls that's ready for the medical textbooks. And this gets described in some, uh, at some length. And at this particular point, it's desperate that they get to Hitler, get rid of his mojo. And by the way, in another chapter, they find Kate Summers and get him back uh, for a reunion cute with Ike. So what happens here is they manage to get the hair remover to Berlin and uh, Hitler, at this particular point, had, puts it on and then realizes that, in fact, his mojo is gone, his, his mustache is gone. So that sets up this little section. Every citizen of Berlin who didn't want to be shot has shown up for Hitler's weekly rally at the Brandenburg Gate. Thousands of goose-stepping Hitler Jugends marched by the podium, giving the Nazi salute to the Fuhrer. Who returned their tribute with an arm half raised, like he was bored. 
One of the yogins tried the same lazy salute and was immediately machine gunned. Point made. What's good for the leader is not necessarily good for the followers. Something to remember, kids. Just because your dad gets drunk doesn't mean you can. Tanks rolled by. Fighter planes did aerobatics overhead. The crowd had been disappointed to learn that they wouldn't catch a glimpse of their beloved Fuhrer's face. It had been announced that he had a cold, probably sabotaged by Jewish Bolshevik traitors who were being tortured to death at that moment, cheers all around. And so he was wearing a surgical mask. Of course, that meant that the masses scrambled to find surgical masks they too could wear, but the stores were all closed for the parade. Besides, only a Jew would cover his face in front of the, their Fuhrer. The crowd was confused. Finally, the parade was over. And the crowd, carefully kept in good order by black uniformed stormtroopers carrying a few German grease guns, was allowed to mass in front of the Fuhrer. Then Hitler began one of his trademark hysterical harangues that so appealed to the German soul. As a berserker frenzy took control of the Fuhrer, he began hopping up and down. The crowd loved it, shaking his head violently from side to side. The crowd shrieked with joy. But when a performer is really into doing his Watusi thing with no thought of consequences, that's when a, more, a wardrobe function, malfunction, is most to be feared. And so it was. Just as Hitler reached that point in the speech that the crowd always anticipated with joy, screaming that the Jews, the Bolsheviks, would never keep Germany from doing this, that, or the other thing, hard to, hard to make out exactly what he claimed the Jews and Bolsheviks were up to whenever he really went off his robber. The Fuhrer shook his head violently and his hat and mask flew off. Dead silence. Oh, this, he yelled, pointing to his bare upper lip and scalp. German scientists have perfected the most advanced hair dyes in the world and they make hair invisible. And for all of, all of you kids out there, invisible means you can't see it, but it's really there. So don't worry. I still got that cute little Charlie Chaplin mustache you will love, the same wacky haircut with the disgusting hank of hair plastered to my jaw, bra, bra. So don't worry, Herring Volk, that means master race. Your Fuhrer is ganz gut, means A-OK. -okay. By this time in 1944, Germans had gotten used to believing just about any kind of shit Hitler told them, no matter how screwy. And so the adults among them just shrugged their shoulders and said, wow, invisible hair dye, that's pretty good. We got some great scientists, best in deep health, especially since we got rid of that phony Jew science like relativity and Darwinism. Well, maybe Darwin wasn't exactly a Jew, but why take chances? Because any stuff you can't understand is probably Jewish. So the adults were all willing to give their fear the benefit of the doubt when a six-year-old boy yelled out in a high-pitched voice that carried over the silence crowd, their fear hat kein Herr. Hitler pointed at the kid and yelled, kill that little Jew. And the stormtroopers promptly machine gunned the kid, his parents, and everyone around them. But the crowd had heard. First, other kids began yelling, their Fuhrer hot kind of hair. Then adults picked up the champ. The Fuhrer realized he was in danger of losing his mojo. Never one to fart around in a time of crisis, Hitler turned to Goering and said, get Rommel and his division back from Normandy. We need to put down this uprising. I'm losing my mojo. Minutes later, Rommel and his division perched on the cliffs overlooking the Normandy beaches, spun around toward the east and began hauling ass toward Berlin. When the invasion began a few hours later, only one of the few troops left behind noticed the boats arriving on the beach. When he hollered out, we're fucked in German, his commanding officer immediately had him shot. Two hours earlier, secret agents Rebay and Guggenheim had burst into Eisenhower's quarters, where the general was sprawled across his bed, stark naked, and sound asleep. General K. Summersby was on one side of him, and secret slop knockers was on the other, and each one had an arm around Ike, who was snoring away with a satisfied smile on his face. Rebe lifted up the sheet and satisfied herself with one glance at her boss. His balls were no longer blue. General, General, the plan worked. Hitler's lost his mojo. We got a picture of him without any hair and no mustache. A million copies are being dropped on Germany right now. Hitler's ordered Rommel's troops back to Berlin. The general jumped out of his bed and yelled for Kay to get him his jeep. We're launching an invasion right now. Get me to my goddamn command post. It's D-Day. Will someone explain to me why it's D-Day? It should be I-Day, because inv invasion starts with an I. What does D stand for anyway? At least put on some pants, General. 
uh, came back. Don't you can't wait to get patient if your pecker blown in the wind. No time for that. Tell everyone I'm wearing the <laughs> I'm wearing the invisible <laughs> invisible uniform. <laughs> I love that. That's where you plan it early on and come back to it at the end. This is this is classic. That's that's a stand up routine almost right there. Uh, amazing. It, something else I noticed in there, and this is this is something I noticed all the way through, is you uh, kind of you break the fourth wall, which is kind of a Mel Brooksy tradition, and direct uh, comments as as the author to the audience, always addressing them as kids, and just like they used to do, you know, don't try this at home, kids, as before we show this next Three Stooges thing. Um, that's kind of a Greek chorus that comments on the whole thing. Well. Uh... That might be a little too high for Luton for what, what I was getting at. Uh, I firmly believe that I am uh, 11 or 12 years old. And, and this novel is written from the point of view of latency. Latency is that sweet spot in all of our lives between toilet training and puberty, when life is just perfect. It's time when uh, you don't even know there's something like machine guns or real killings but you do have a daisy red rider. Yeah. You know, the, that, that, that really is the consciousness I'm trying to get across. And so, yes, anytime there's a long word, for instance, I pause and in parentheses, I define the word uh, for the kids in the, in the uh, readership. Yeah. yeah. No, that's, it's great. It's, it's a nice touch. And again, it's it's one more thing that keeps things moving along in a very different way than the standard standard novel. And again, much much appreciated. Um, were you always going to be a writer? Um, well, that's the thing. It's it's kind of funny. Uh, yes, I always wanted to be a writer. Uh, my dad started out actually both writing and illustrating, and he was willing to go either way, whichever made him money first. And uh, the illustration, of course, made him more money. Uh, but he wrote all his life. And like a lot of Irishmen, there is an unpublished, uh, probably 100,000 page novel that's in my barn. And I would like to get to work on it someday. But, uh, you know, I've got my own things to do. Um, I always did want to be a writer. And the problem was that uh, I found it so easy to write nonfiction. Mm -hmm. And so once I got to a point where I could uh, get contracts and uh, do some writing that paid off for me, uh, one thing led to another uh, with the FBI. It's kind of, I wrote an, uh, a book about the FBI's publicity and that kind of put me on first base. And then I was able to get a contract to do a biography of J. Edgar Hoover, kind of put me on second base. I got a contract to write a history of American anti-communism. That's on third base. And then finally, uh, history of the FBI. But it wasn't until I finished that uh, kind of uh, petrology that I realized what I really wanted to do is write a novel. And writing fiction is so enjoyable. Uh, it's hard to explain to people just how much joy you get out of sitting down and writing when you do not know what's coming next. You don't know what the next word is going to be, but it's all just coming out and it's so much fun. I, I don't put myself on the same level as Lee Childs, but Lee Childs pretty much operates the same way. He gets a multi-million dollar advance. I skip that step. But what he does then, what he does then is he paces back and forth in his study, smoking unfiltered cigarettes and drinking black coffee uh, for about eight months. And then suddenly puts down a paragraph about pigs in a pig farm. And then another month, he figures out what that paragraph is leading to. And then it all just starts coming out. And he literally, uh, I guess what writers just shouldn't say literally, he, he really doesn't know what's happening until all of it comes together in the scene that every Jack Reacher fan is waiting for where he just beats the living crap out of all the characters in the book yeah. and it's kind of like a Coen Brothers movie where they customarily kill everybody and then burn down the set in yeah. the last in the last scene <laughs> so I, I just I just think that it's a joy that's hard to describe and that is 
uh, writing things that come out of you, but you didn't know they were there until they come out. I think that's just amazing and wonderful. Yeah, there are so many Easter eggs in this book. I mean, fun little bits and pieces. And I think one of the ones as an old comic book collector from many years ago is, is why and the explanation that they gave at DC Comics, why Superman wasn't winning the war all by himself for the Allies. Yeah. And you could you explain why that when he went to test, he came out 4F. Well, I actually think, I mean, Ben were reading this somewhere, but it's so perfect. I might have made it up, but no, I don't think I'm smart enough to make it up. It was easy. What happens is that um, people begin wondering why the heck is this war going to take more than a couple of days? Because it's obvious we can draft Superman and he can spend a couple of days with the Japanese and a couple of days with the Germans, war over. And so they actually had to figure out why he wasn't in the army. And the reason he wasn't in the army, when he went to take his eye test, Superman has, of course, X-ray vision. Uh, his brains probably aren't as highly developed as his vision. And what happens is he looks through the wall and he reads the eye chart in the next examining room. And so he gets all the letters wrong. He's 4F. And now there are millions of people ahead of him. They're not going to let him take the test again. And so he's going to have to <laughs> fly around defeating Nazi spies on the home front. Yeah. Which I think is a pretty good way of explaining why the war actually lasted four years. Yeah. That, and, that, and again, that's one of those really nifty little bits and pieces of trivia that are scattered throughout this thing and and tons of, of is there anything you were planning on putting in and decided not to put in uh let's see i do have such a fascination with uh daisy red rider uh, BB uh gun, yeah that um i suppose i could have figured out a way of both the Americans, the Germans, and the Japanese getting together, having a parlor in the side. That's all we're going to use, our BB guns. So I saved that for another book. I've got another novel which, uh, in which that features uh, very prominently. Uh -huh. uh, as far as that goes, well, I don't know. I, I think that I carried the Indian uprising about as far as you could uh, without becoming, uh, I think, so provocative that Indians would be uh, surrounding. Uh, actually, we have a place in Southampton that's surrounded by an Indian reservation. Hmm. And uh, if any of them, this is getting me in worse, if any of them can read, which I'm not sure, uh, but if any of them uh, read what I wrote about the Indians and how their uprising was put down, I think that'd be in trouble. So I think I pushed that about as far as it could go. Okay. I guess so your readers can be looking out for it. There's a secret weapon the FBI comes up with, which is brewed in St. Louis. <laughs> the Indians. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not going to say anything beyond that. I will point That's out a couple important. of other, other fun little bits and pieces. Uh, you managed to work in the Dick Tracy two-way wrist radio, Yes. which we all have now. We call it our phone. Uh, <laughs> and the Post Toasties Junior G-Man. I mean, I, I, that has been a long time since I even thought about Post Toasties, much less the fact they had a Junior G-Man club. And that's certainly, a, Yeah. It, it was originally the Melvin Purvis uh, Junior G-Man club. He was the guy who got Dillinger. Yep. And Hoover was really just the guy who got the guy who got Dillinger. But then Hoover booted him out, booted him out of the FBI yeah. so that they could get rid of the middleman, which is basically Jerry Hoover, Dr. Yeah. Dillinger. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I particularly like the idea of a, a secret decoder ring. And, uh, the kids, of course, just have plastic models, but uh, Hilla and Peggy, I think, get uh, Tiffany versions of the decoder <laughs> ring. So, yeah, there's a lot of things like that. Actually, my first book about the FBI was all about things like decoder rings, you know, the Republican uh, cards for all of the public enemies that the FBI killed. So, <laughs> so you could collect Machine Gun Kelly and Pretty Boy Floyd and Baby yeah. Fest. Uh, yeah, I know it sounds like uh, it's too strange to be true, but 
As, as you know, things are really strange are often true. Yes, yes, indeed. I, I have two more I want to mention. And then one of them is a quote, a Ring, Ring Lardner quote, actually. Uh, Shut up, Hoover explained, which... <laughs> which comes from a book called, a story called The Young Immigrants, and it's been quoted many times, and i really like to see that again. And um, the mathematical function that is not used much anymore, casting out nines, which yeah. is of a certain vintage that some of, I think we share uh, in that regard. Yeah. I just think it's funny that every time one of my characters has to uh, add up something really complicated, like uh, seven and one, uh, he then checks his answer by casting something. Yeah. It's it, look look it up if you if you've known if you're too young to remember what that's all about. Look it up and you find it's kind of bizarre, but but interesting. So, what do you hope when people put this book down, they take away from it? Um, I only want them to take away from it that they had a good time, and let's say four hundred pages maybe that seven hours of entertainment and giving the world seven hours of entertainment is doing a lot more good in the world than most people. So that's really, it. I think also that uh, I'm not saying that everything in life, no matter how horrible, uh, can be a source of humor because that's actually not true. There yeah. are things you really can't make fun of, but most things, most things, uh, if you look at them with uh, kind of a Mad Magazine perspective on things, yes, there is humor. And I think that it would be a good thing if more people uh, realize that. Uh, I've seen people get so uh, upset at Marjorie Taylor Greene, for instance, they were practically on the floor swallowing their tongues. But, you know, really, uh, she's a pretty funny lady. As, as her moments. Uh, we should mention uh, before we roll out of here uh, the uh, your website and any other information about what you're up to. We'd like to share with our, our listeners. Sure, the the website's real easy. It's richardgetpowers.com. You know, all one word. And yes, I've written a novel called uh, "The Most Unkindest Cut." And as you probably, maybe you, I'm not going to make any assumptions here, but mm -hmm. for many men, uh, the first trauma that they've experienced was being circumcised. And then on top of that, what happened to the foreskin? And so uh, this novel is really about a hero's search for his foreskin, which puts him eventually into the search for the foreskin of our Lord and Savior. Oh my goodness. And, which is one of the holiest relics in, uh, in Christendom. Yeah. So that's the, that's the novel, uh, um, The Most Unkindest Cut. I also have another novel completed, and that one is called My Struggle, which is the Cock Cabusitis Wars by Jennifer Aniston. And it's about a plague that uh, afflicts the United States where men are turned into insatiable sexual animals. Hard to believe that, that could happen, but it happens, in, happens in my book. And Jennifer Aniston is the person who comes up with a mask device, which is basically a saltpeter infused jockstrap that uh, protects people from this. And that particular novel has in it redeemed characters like Harvey Weinstein uh, breaks out of jail and he's a, he's a good guy now. Uh, Brad Pitt is in it, Leo is in it. Uh, Jennifer Aniston is the leader of this revolt uh, against the powerful people in the country we're trying to keep uh, people from masking up. So uh -huh. that's, that's the novel, which is, and cockcabusitis uh, is the name of this disease. And that comes from a wonderful quote by David Crosby, recently deceased, mm -hmm. much lamented David Crosby. And he said that as far as I can tell, all, <laughs> all I am is a caboose attached to my dick. <laughs> And so that's where I came up with that title. There you go. Words of wisdom, kids, as we, as we say. Um, it has been... Yeah, don't, don't say that in front of your moms. 
Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I have a feeling you're an inciter of, of all kinds of fun and games. And I would I would be very interesting to, to hang out with you sometime. Um, I think it's time to roll it up here today, but I want to thank you so much for being with us today. The book is called Secret Agent Gals, and the author is our guest today, Richard Kidd Powers. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me and for being such a good guy. All right.